Hello and welcome to Ryoga's summer 2014 season preview thing. I don't even know why people watch this. I just go over the next season's chart and just pretend like I know what the fuck I'm talking about. But hey, people like them, so I'm going to keep doing them, I guess. Uh, so luckily there's not as many shows as there usually are each season, so this will be shorter, hopefully. But I still like to ramble a lot, so may as well get right on into it. Uh, first up we have Bakumatsu Rock. The story is set in the Bakumatsu era at the end of the Shogun's rule over Japan in the middle of the 19th century. The Tokugawa Shogunate uses the brainwashing Heaven Songs by the top idols and Shinsengumi to subjugate the country and its people. In this Japan, writing or singing any songs beside the Heaven Songs is a capital offense. Ryoma Sakamoto and the other rockers rise up and change the world with rock and roll for freedom and justice. This sounds a lot like a rock and roll version of that AKB anime. You know, the one where, like, all fun is banned, and then they're just like, well, we're idols, and we're gonna do stuff. But that one had them, like, using fucking, like, lightsabers with their music and shooting down rockets that were anti-fun. <laughs> so it was, like, absurdly amusing. I, I have no idea if this would be, like, in the same vein or not. I, I... Just based on it, it looks like it's just dumb, really. <laughs> So, uh, I'm probably not going to watch it, but if I hear that it is absurd, uh, just like the, uh, AKB one, then I'll probably pick it up, because, I don't know. I like absurd shows that are just fucking crazy and wacky shit. I watched fucking Nobunaga the Fool and Inferno Cop, and they're, like, amazing, okay? So, that's just the kind of person I am. Anyways, moving on. We have Free Eternal Summer, which is a sequel. Jeez, I don't even have to read this. Um, uh, yep, it's free season two. Uh, free was probably my second favorite KyoAni show. I liked Coconut Kanata the most, even though it's, I still think it was just average. Um, I would have liked the first season of free a lot more if it didn't go all fucking drama up the ass by the end, because I literally did not care about the drama at all. <laughs> the characters were not exactly fantastic. Some of them were neat, but it was, it was not set up in a way that drama would have really worked, and it didn't, surprising, unsurprisingly, I should say. Um, but still, I enjoyed the first season enough that I don't mind giving the second season a go. Uh, I hope it continues in the vein of, like, self-awareness and being just kind of silly. Uh, and less the, the, the drama angle. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. Maybe second season of Free will be better than the first. I hope it is. Uh, anyways, moving on. We have Glass Lip. Tokofuka Tokofukama's family runs a glass-working business in a small seaside town. She hangs out with her four best friends at a cafe called Kazumichi. Tazemichi. During the summer break of their senior year in high school, they meet a transfer student named Kakuro Ukukura, who claims that a voice from the future talks to him and that it's led him to Toko. His arrival sets off a series of events that will make their final summer together one full of hope and heartache. Um, so the first thing I know right off the bat, I actually know something for once, um, is that this is the first PA Works in a while that isn't being written by Mario Kata. And I know PA Works has done other shows not written by Mario Kata. The first one that comes to mind is Uchiden Kazuku, which was a great show. Um, but, I mean, this is the first show with this art style in a while that hasn't been written by uh, Mario Kata. Like, you just... You see this art style and you expect a certain kind of show from it. Because Mario Kata has written pretty much all of those. Except I don't think she wrote Red Data Girl. Anyways. Point is, uh, I don't like Mario Kata's writing. I, I feel like this is public knowledge at this point, and I don't really hide it either. Uh, I feel like she does not understand how to write drama at all. Uh, the only people worse at writing drama than her is Key, so <laughs> maybe they should hire her. Um, so I'm excited that it's not written by her, so I really want to give it a go. And uh, also the fact that I like that it's about uh, glassworking. I learned a bit about glassworking of quite a few years ago. It's really interesting stuff, and I really doubt this is going to be educational at all about it. It's just going to take liberties and use it as an excuse for the setting to be original or whatever. It's not actually going to do anything with it. But, uh, I don't know. The whole point of the premise is to draw you in, and I even if they cover it just a slight bit, you know, glassworking is pretty cool stuff. Um, <laughs> because that, that image totally has everything to do with glassworking, like I said. Uh, but I don't know. It, it says it's gonna be, uh, summer, one la one final summer together full of hope and heartache, so I'm actually hoping it'll be, it could be well done, since it's not Mario Kata. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> got a Mario Kata. Anyways, moving on, we have Shirogane no Ishi Argevolon. I have no idea if that's how the last word's pronounced at all. 
The story takes place in a world where two countries, Arandas and Ingelmia, have been warring against each other for a very long time. Tokimune, a young man belonging to the 8th Autonomous Unit of Arandas, saves a girl named Jamie when she is attacked by enemy forces. In order to survive, he rides the new weapon, Argavol, and end fights. So this is basically your standard main hero rescues someone and they get a mech that's super fucking amazing, which is most mech shows. Some are pretty fancy with it, like, I think Star Driver was the first show that actually gave an excuse for why the main character's mech was so much stronger than everyone else's. Um, that made sense. <laughs> I mean, everyone, all the other excuses are just like, it was the first model made, so it's the best, which makes no fucking sense, because technology gets better as you progress. Anyways, um, I don't mind giving it a go. It's, it's... These kind of premises are just what they are. They're just premises. And I know that, you know, main character gets super powerful mecha, saves chick, and stuff happens is most shows. But all that matters is really how you use it. And so I can just give it three episodes to see if it does anything with it or not. I don't mind doing that at all. Uh, plus, I like mecha shows. I don't know. Fuck, giant robots are fucking cool. Come on. Um, it's part of why we love Japan. Come on, guys. Uh, so yeah, I'll give it a go, three episodes and see if it's good or not. If it's stupid and doesn't use its premise in any helpful way at all, then I don't have to watch it, so there you go. Uh, moving on, we have Tokyo Ghoul. The suspense horror dark fantasy story is set in Tokyo, which is haunted by mysterious ghouls who are devouring humans. People are gripped by the fear of these ghouls whose identities are masked in mystery. An ordinary college student named Kaneki encounters Rize, a girl who is an avid reader like him at the, at the cafe he frequents. Little does he realize that his fate will change overnight. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about the Tokyo Ghoul manga. Uh, and I like that it's being adapted by Studio Piero. Uh, they've done a couple shows that I really like. So, um, that's cool. I mean, the studios don't really fucking mean anything. Because I, I've, I've said it, like, once before. But s the thing with studios is that literally they're just the producers. Or, like, they're the building that the people work at. There's actually no dedicated staff in them at all. Except for, like I said, maybe the producers who, who fund everything. Otherwise, the staff, like the director, the writers, etc. Like, they, they go across studios all the fucking time. Like, <laughs> there are people who work at JC Staff. And then, like, maybe next season they'll do something at PA Works. Um... I think one of the easiest examples that I can think of off the top of my head is, I believe, the director who did Toradora and, uh, obviously also Mario Kata, who adapted the Toradora scripts, uh, worked on Anohana, which was an A1 Pictures work. So, people jump studios all the time, and they really don't mean anything. It's just who's giving the money and who, they, you know, who's saying, oh, I want these people to work on this show, or just the people who get assigned to it, or whatever. Um... So it doesn't really mean a whole lot, and I don't know why I just went on the rant, because I'm just wasting fucking time and no one gives a shit. Shut the fuck up, Ryoga. Uh, point is, I've heard good things about Tokyo Ghoul. It's being done by a studio that typically puts out shows that I like, which really doesn't mean anything because of everything I just said, but I choose to ignore it anyways because I'm fucking hypocritical, I guess. So <laughs> I'm interested to see it. And plus, it's it's a, it's a, it's a dark fantasy. Dark fantasies are cool. Um, not to say they're automatically great. You can still fuck them up. But it'll uh, it'll be neat. Although, no, although nothing. <laughs> I was I was gonna try and put like some cynicism in to like try and like dissuade any hype I could possibly have, but I my, I'm not that hype to begin with, anyways. I, I'm just hopeful that it's gonna be good, but I don't know that much about the source material to be that hyped about it. So I'm definitely gonna give it a go. I've heard good things. So mm. moving on, we have Rail Wars. The story is set in parallel world where Japan did not privatize its national railways. Now, Hito Takeyama is an ordinary high school boy who dreams of a comfortable future working for the top-rated Japanese ra national railways. He is assigned as a trainee in the railway security force full of odd characters such as Sakurai, a troublemaker who hates men. On top of that, an extremist group called RJ plots to privatize the Japanese national railways. Railways. So, this show proper doesn't take itself very seriously, <laughs> as is pretty obvious by the synopsis. Uh, it's rail wars, like literally train wars, you know, it's, it's a bunch of people going in different railways owned by different companies or something, and then they're just going to duke it out to be the best rail station. <laughs> it sounds fun. It sounds loads of fun. Uh, especially if the cast really is full of odd characters uh, that, you know, 
Sakurai, a troublemaker who hates men, isn't the most odd character ever created or thought up, <laughs> and actually, but if there are other characters that are odd and such too, it could be a it could be a fun show that doesn't really take itself too seriously, but it's still could you, you can you can take yourself not that seriously and still be very intense. Um, all that matters is again how you handle yourself. So uh, it seems like a show that'll be lots of fun. You know, I mean, I keep saying that, but I mean, it's obvious. Like, did you fucking did you hear the synopsis I just read? It's fucking train stations duking it out against each other while this evil fucking capitalist corporation tries to buy them out and nationalize everything. It's amazing. Um, or privatize them. Whatever. Fuck it. Moving on. We have Futsu no Joshi Kosai ga Local Doll Yatamina. And side note, I think that's the first title I've ever seen with brackets in it. Huh. In the story, high school girl Nanako became her town's local idol at the request of her uncle. She and her upperclassman Yukari, a girl who seems perfect but ends up being airheaded, both become idols of their provincial, uh, provincial area. Pro pro provincial? Provincial area. I'm fucking stupid. They get interviewed by the town's shopping center and go on television low-budget cable in old concerts on the roof of the department store. The girl's salaries come from the town's taxes. So I normally don't like idol shows because I think idol culture in general is fucking stupid and also just screwed up in very many ways in Japan, but this is, like, it sounds amusing. It's basically taking idol culture and like, hey, what if we had idols and they were in the middle of fucking nowhere? <laughs> and it's like, that could be fun, amusing. Uh, like, like I'd say, they get interviewed by the town's shopping center, they go on television, which is low-budget cable, and they hold concerts on the roof of the department store. Like, it's basically... It could be either one of two ways. It's, it's, they're idols, but no one really gives too much of a shit because they're in the middle of rural areas, or it's people trying to engage in a culture in the rural areas and, like, enjoying it and such. And it could either be glorifying idol culture, like, even people in the country want idols, yeah, or it could just be kind of poking fun at idol culture. And I think it should be obvious that I hope it pokes fun at idol culture, but... You know, it is what it is, but I, either way, I want to see if it's serious or not, or what it does with its premise. Uh, it could end up being very unfunny, for all I know. So, um, get another show, I'll give a couple episodes to see what it does. Um, it's honestly not that hard to get me to try the show out. <laughs> it's harder to get me to keep watching the show after the three episodes, mainly because I fall behind on shows right by that point. Anyways, uh, point is that... I'm I'm willing to give it a shot, see how it goes. I don't very have that many expectations, but hey, you know. Anyways, moving on. We have Shin Strange Plus, which is a sequel to the Strange Plus TV series, which I remember because it's the same fucking image as the one from the first season, actually. The, I think the first season image had, like, four bars of people, and this one just has two, like, it zoomed in on two of them. Um... I didn't watch the first season, so I don't really care about the second season. If you watched the first season of Strange Plus and you enjoyed it, here is your second season. There you go. You are welcome. <laughs> Moving on. We have the Sailor Moon remake, which I feel like I don't really need to read the synopsis for, but just for nostalgia's sake, I'm going to do it anyways. Usagi Tsukino in the sec is a second year middle school girl who is a little clumsy and a crybaby, but she is full of energy. One day she meets Luna, a black cat with a crescent moon on her forehead, and she transforms into Sailor Moon, a pretty guardian of love and justice. As a chosen guardian of justice, Usagi has a mission to find the illusionary silver crystal with the other guardians and to protect the princess. Meanwhile, the Queen of the Dark Kingdom, Queen Beryl, also sends minions to the town where Usagi lives to obtain the illusionary silver crystal, which is immense power. So finally, finally, the silver moon, the silver... I almost said Silver Moon remake because I was thinking of Silver Spoon. <laughs> God, I miss Silver Spoon. Anyway, Sailor Moon. Uh, Sailor Moon remake that's been in the works for a while. And I think this time it might actually, finally, be airing. I know the last, like, two or three seasons it's been like, hey, we're going to give you Sailor Moon, and then it didn't happen. But I think it may actually finally happen. And I believe pretty much anyway... Anyone, everyone, I'm tripping over my, own, over my own words today, and I'm not even tired. I, like, purposely waited a couple hours to wake up first before doing this, and I'm still tripping my, over my own fucking words. That's just how professional I am. Anyways, point is, pretty much everyone's gonna watch this. It's Sailor Moon, everyone's gonna watch it for the nostalgia. Everyone's gonna realize it's not as good as they remember it being, because that's just how nostalgia works. Um, 
but going into Sailor Moon fully expecting that my nostalgia is like clouding my judgment of how the original series actually was quality wise, I think I'll be able to enjoy it because a lot of people are, like I said, a lot of people are going to go into this and be like, this is shit. I don't remember it being this shit. It, it kind of was. <laughs> I mean, it was fun and it had a lot of good things about it, but it was still really, really nothing special. <laughs> I'm sorry. The only reason it was special is because it was the first of its kind to be so marketed in the U.S. And that's how the Western audience loved it because it was the first of its kind marketed like crazy. And so people had never seen anything like it before. Um, and that kind of blinded people. Not to mention it was like 10 year olds that watched it. So you can't really hold the same standards of, you know, viewing stuff to them. But the point is, Sailor Moon isn't that fucking amazing of anything, <laughs> but it's still fun, it still does pretty well at what it tries to do, and everyone's gonna watch this, and there's gonna be lots of fucking flame wars on the internet because of it, and I can fucking see it coming, and you, I'm throwing down my money now, it's gonna happen, so just know that I called it, that's all that you need to know, just remember that I called it. Anyways, moving on, we have Shonen Hollywood. The anime will tell an original story set 15 years after the novel story. It takes place at a fictional theater called Hollywood Tokyo in Harajuku, where members of the idol group Shonen Hollywood develop their talents with diligent work and studying. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, this is pretty much your standard Fujoshi show. It's a bunch of guys that are attractive, and they... I don't know if they necessarily want a girl, but they're just on the screen for you to, to woo over, I guess? Um, it's interesting that it's an original story set 15 years after the novel story. I have no idea what the novel even is or about or anything and interesting it's based on an actual novel not a light novel an actual novel not that that means it's better a light novel and novels only difference is the fact that a novel is longer and has no pictures in it not that light novels even have that many pictures to begin with it's just like 10 images per novel really occasionally like, it's, it's really not that thing. I, I just think it's stupid how people are like, oh, it's a novel, so it's clearly better than the light novel, when really the only fucking difference is their length. Light novels in and themselves don't produce worse work than novels. The only reason that would happen is because of the, the, how do I explain this? The expectations that people have for light novels. Stupid otaku pandering crap. Whereas normal novels don't really have that kind of expectation on them, so they are more free to do more things, you know. So, it's not really light novels as a medium's fault, it's the people who write them and the expectations put on them and the, in a way, requirements put on them in order to be successful. Not that people of, you know, people manage to go outside of the comfort zone and still be, and still make it work, but, you know, just saying. Anyways, commentary on mediums of entertainment aside, uh, this show wasn't really for me. And as far as I'm aware of, it's not absurdly ridiculous, like, you know, Udapri and uh, other shows and such like that. So I don't really care. So not a show for me. If you like cute guys that are it's apparently Western influenced because of Hollywood. Um, <laughs> I never thought the two words I'd ever see together are shonen and Hollywood. Um, so there you go. Uh, moving on, we have Sword Art Online 2, which is the sequel to the Sword Art Online TV show. Sequel, not that I need to read the synopsis otherwise, but I don't have to read it because it's a sequel. So, Sword Art Online 2. How this has been the inevitable arrival of things to be. Yep. Okay, I'm just going to say it right now. I'm going to be watching it because I, I'm kind of a completionist. If I watch the first season of something, unless I fucking hated the shit out of it, which I kind of did. <laughs> I, I'm weird in that I, I have, it's, it's one of those things where typically if I fucking hate something, I don't care to watch the second season, but there are certain shows where I just have to keep watching to see if it gets any better or if the train wreck just continues and Sword Art Online is one of those shows. It's, it's, there are shows that are just bad, and then there are shows that are fascinating in how bad they are, and Sword Art Online is the latter, so I, I'm gonna be watching, and I mean, to, to its credit, I mentioned it before, but 
the author sort of online writ that writ that I am I know English wrote that when he was like 15 or something like do you really think anyone can write well when they're 15 like do you do you really think they can because no they can't 15 year olds can't fucking write <laughs> and honestly and I'm gonna say this and you can fucking quote me for it for a 15 year old Sword Art Online was pretty good. That's the only praise I can give to it, and you can fucking quote me on that, because I will stand behind that statement. I also stand behind the fact that the show was fucking bad. The point is, for a 15-year-old, if you take that into account, it was actually not that bad. It could have been a lot fucking worse for a 15-year-old. Anyways, point is, the author himself has even said, you know, he looked back at Sword Art Online and Alfheim Online and has been like, yeah, those were kind of shit. If your own author is willing to admit the stuff he did in the past when he was 15 was fucking garbage, there is hope. And I'm not even being sarcastic when I say that. He, he, there is hope. If he can, if he has gotten to the point where he can recognize how bad the first, technically first two seasons, because Sword Online and Alfheim, the first two game arcs are, then there's hope. And honestly, as you get older, you generally get better, get better as a writer. I mean, right, right? It gets better, right? I I mean, you can't get any worse, right? Like, as you go through the arcs, you, you get older and better as an author, right? Anyways, point is, I hope that it is better than the first two story arcs, although I don't have massive expectations. It'll probably still be, uh, again, prediction time. The whole thing about this arc is that Kirito turns into a girl. Uh, for whatever fucking reason. Um... <laughs> Probably because the author's like, you know what? I'm tired of Akiro being a self-insert. Now I'm gonna make him a character that people want to self-insert into. Oh, I'm just kidding. That was fucking awful. Um, basically, he's going from power fantasy self-insert material to masturbation material. <laughs> like, I genuinely think that's really the most reason I went into it. I'm sure there's some in-story reason for it. Maybe like you can only make a female character in the game. I don't fucking know. But anyways, prediction time. So, the whole point behind this is that, obviously, Kirito has to have a harem of women who love him because he's Jesus. So, what I believe is going to happen is that he's going to come across a female, you know, the female that is interested in him in this arc. And what'll happen is that she won't know that he's a dude at first. It won't be obvious. It won't, like, he won't reveal it or anything. And then she'll just kind of assume that, he, that he's a chick. So, we're going to get this story arc where, over time... She is a heterosexual female, but for some inexplicable reason, she's going to start turning into a lesbian because it's fucking Kirito, although she doesn't know he's a dude, and she's gonna be like, oh my god, I'm actually like a fucking lesbian because I love this woman, and then it'll find, it'll, she'll find out that he's actually a dude, and then she'll be relieved and she'll still love him because he's a dude, and it turns out that, yeah, <laughs> that's my prediction. It's fully what I expect to happen, and honestly... If I'm wrong about that, that would make me happier than if I was right. So, yeah. I spent way too fucking long on this. Let's move on. We have Puri Bara, which is a new Pretty Rhythm Idol television anime series. If you like the Pretty Rhythm Idol television anime series, here's more of the Pretty Rhythm Idol television anime series. And there you go. Moving on. We have Barakamon. The slice of life comedy centers around the Ikemen. Handsome. 23-year-old. I mean, what? Why was, why was that even there? <laughs> All according to Keikaku. Keikaku means plan. Like, why didn't you just leave it as handsome? Anyways, 23-year-old calligrapher Seishu Honda, who moves to the remote Goto Islands off the western coast of Kyushu. Kyushu. Seishu grew up in the city and story and, and the story chronicles... Sorry, the chart's hard to see. Seishu interactions with the people of the island who drove, who drive tractors on public roads and don't enter through its front door when they visit. On top of that, Seishu's house becomes a hangout for the island's children. So, the dude owns an island and he hangs out with a bunch of little kids and it's the country. Why did they have to specify that he was handsome? <laughs> Why did they do that? <laughs> Anyways, um... Yeah, I I don't know. It it actually seems like it be, could be. It's one of those things where I should be like, oh, it's obviously gonna be such a fucking great story because it's gonna be about this dude and taking care of all these islands, children and interacting with people. And there's so much character interaction. It's gonna be so good. But the problem is, you can do that and still be really fucking boring. And I'm sorry, 
But with a promo image like that and a synopsis combined with a synopsis like that, you look pretty fucking boring. I'll keep an ear out. If it turns out it's actually pretty well written and not boring, then I will watch it. And if it is boring, then I'm just gonna keep staying away from it. It's just how it is. Moving on, we have Sengoku Basara Judge End, which is based on the 2010 game Sengoku Basara 3, and we'll have fights. I've never watched a Sengoku Basara series, although as far as I'm aware of, it seems to be pretty popular considering there's a lot more of them or something, and it's still going, so it's one of the few game adaptations that did the anime that people actually like, I guess. But I've never played Sengoku Basara, so I don't fucking care. As far as I'm aware of, it's basically Dynasty Warriors, except it's Japanese history instead of Chinese. <laughs> That's all I know about the games, and I'm probably horribly wrong. So, yeah, I, I don't care because I've never played the games. I never watched any of the other shows. And with the title like fucking end in it, you think it might just be the last one in like a series or something. Like maybe you have to watch the other series to understand what's going on in this final season or something. I don't fucking know. Anyways, moving on. We have Alden Noah Zero. The project's tag tag tagline. Really? The project's tagline reads, let justice be done though the heavens fall. In 1972, a hypergate was discovered on the surface of the moon, but then humankind came into contact with beings from Mars, leading to war. So this is basically Mars of Destruction. Original story by Gen Urobuchi, blah, 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 whatever. The point is, director Gen Urobuchi, you all know him, wrote Doka, wrote Psychopaths, wrote Gargantia, although that's misleading because he actually really only wrote the first and last episodes of Gargantia, and then like a bunch, like literally every other episode had a different writer in Gargantia. He just wrote the beginning and the end because it was a project meant to train new writers, and they didn't do a very good job. <laughs> Let's just say that training exercise didn't go so well because that show wasn't so great, and very unfucking surprisingly the first and last episodes were the best ones. Go figure. Anyways, point is, that he's the one writing it, and the director is the guy who did uh, Fate Zero, which is, like, whatever. I, I didn't care that much for Fate Zero. I really didn't. It was okay. Um, he also directed Wandering Sun, though, which I really liked, so there's that. So I don't really care all that much, because the thing I always try and pump, like, program into people is that l director, I mean, probably the best thing to go off of, to be fair, is rather than the studio, the people actually working on the project. That's fair, but it's also important to keep in mind that just because certain people are doing something doesn't guarantee it will be good or bad. Anyone is capable of making a bad work. Anyone is capable of making a great work, although that's less unlikely. It's a lot easier to fuck something up than it is to do something right. So just keep that in mind, although I'm going to completely play devil's advocate to myself and possibly you know, contradict what I just said and say that I do believe Gen Urobuchi is probably the best writer in the industry right now. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's just some pretentious dickbag. <laughs> but honestly, he doesn't have that much competition. He really doesn't. People lately have been holding him to a much higher standard, which to be fair, makes sense. But like, for example, Gargantia, I mean... To be fair, people don't realize he only wrote the first and last episodes of Gargantia, but even then, like, people are like, oh man, fuck Gen, he's a hack writer, blah, 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 Gen Rebootcher, blah. And it's like, you know, he's still probably the best writer in the industry. He still needs to work on his character writing. Like, he did, like, it's weird because he has, like, these, like, occasional moments of fucking brilliance, like the writer and waiver thing that was going on in Fate Zero, which was the best thing about that show. But otherwise, like, he, the, the thing is, he writes very specific characters. Like, he, he has a very specific ideology and such programmed into each character, and they rarely deviate from that. But the thing is, that can be a good thing if you use it correctly. I feel like Madoka is a perfect example of that, along with Ryder Waver in Fate Zero. There wasn't a whole, whole lot defining them. It was just this one event. I mean... I mean there's only so much you can do in a show anyways. I feel like people expect like the most, like, I feel like when I talk about Gen Urobuchi's characters, it's like I expect the most fucking multi-dimensional characters ever written ever. And then there are lots of other shows I like where characters are just as one-dimensional. Not in the sense that, you know, they're thin, but just in the sense that they 
have like one defining aspect to them and they keep to that aspect through the entire show. It's like characters don't have to feel like real people in shows. They just have to the point of characters is they're I mean, if it's a character driven series, they should feel a hell of a lot like real people so you can care about them and it feel they feel like genuine people. But when you have a story based, you know, or a plot based story, you can have characters that are defined by a very specific ideology and those ideologies push the plot forward. Like, it, it, it's fine. You can do that. Like, I, I feel like I can go to almost any show and most characters will be defined by one very specific event or where one very specific ideology. And that carries them through the entire show. All that matters is how it's used. Because you can have a character with a specific ideology reacting differently to certain things, which is what makes them interesting. When you have a character acting in a very specific ideology, it's not a black and white thing. Like, it's not like, oh, they react in a very specific way, they're evil, or they're good, or blah, 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 blah. They can still react differently to certain things, which is what makes them interesting as characters. How they process knowledge and what they should do, uh, based on the ideology that defines them. And I feel like I'm giving way too long of a character speech here, so I should probably move the fuck on. Point is, I'm excited for the show. I still think Gen Rubuchi is a great writer, probably the best one in the industry, although that doesn't mean he's perfect. Uh, and I'm excited for it. So there's a thing. Okay, moving on by. Kamega Kill. Uh, Kamega Kill. The dark action fantasy story follows Akame, a girl who was, brought, who was bought, brainwashed, and raised by the Empire as an assassin. After meeting Akame, a boy named Tatsumi vows to stand up to the evil of, of the Empire. I have fucking burps going on and shit um so i've i'm i'm interested to, to watch this because um i uh don't ask how it happened i saw like one chapter of this manga i don't even remember if it was an actual chapter or if it was like one of those side chapters like 0.5 uh but this is some fucked up shit <laughs> like they like i said before tokyo ghoul was a dark fantasy this is gonna be dark in like the fucking almost grim dark sense like sh shit fucked up shit goes on in this series, um, and I feel like it's it will probably end up, if that is an indicator for how the show usually goes and it wasn't just some random side chapter, I feel like that's an indication of, like, of how the series goes. It's going to be the most talked about series this season. Um, of course, censorship may also play a part if it is, and then they get censored and whatever. Um, well, the point is, I'm going to watch it. I'm interested to see it because I saw that one chapter, and it was... <coughs> Excuse me. It was uh, decently fucked up, and it's like, well, it's morbidly fascinating in a way, I guess. <laughs> so I'm gonna watch it. I don't fucking understand how my brain works half the time either.